Hi class, my name is Mr. George Gitonga. Today we'll be looking at BJS 2105, Crime Prevention. And our topic today we shall be Principles of Crime Opportunity Theory. So you can start by looking at the introduction. So previously I looked at the theories of crime opportunity. The first one being Routine Activity Theory, which talked about uh, predatory crimes being the first thing that must be there for a crime to occur is the suitable target, motivated offender, and lack of guardianship. Then the second theory was the crime pattern theory. That one was involving interaction of people and the environment. And the last one was the rational choice theory that spoke about the decision making of the offender. So we'll look at all of those as we look at the 10 principles. So the first principle is opportunities play a role in causing all crime. So for there to be a crime that is occurring, there must be an opportunity. So for example, if you have a burglary, for someone to come and steal things in your house, if they have left an open door or an open window. So all that is an opportunity. Or even if you're talking about your students, if you want to commit a crime of exam cheating, there are those opportunities that you'll take advantage of. For example, no invigilation, big room, or somewhere where maybe too many students that invigilator cannot control. So all of those opportunities are what play a role in causing certain crimes. When you're looking at bars and restaurants. So for example, you can see here, design of the pub may play a role in a crime occurring. For example, if the pub is too big, you may not be able to control everybody. For example, you see here, the clientele, if it's many males. As you know, men are very volatile and can be easily aggressed. So if you have so many young people, that presents a risk for violence. And also probably, if the staff you have are not well employed or well trained, for example, bouncers. If your bouncers are very easily aggressed, you cannot expect them to come and control your clientele. So all of those opportunities play a role in causing crime. Then you have our second principle, Crime opportunities are highly specific. So you can focus on the two crimes you had previously looked at. For example, if you have a burglar, its opportunities are unlocked doors and unlocked windows. But if you're talking about robbing a bank, of course you cannot say that the door being open is an opportunity because we expect that doors of the banks are open. Or for example, if you talk about exam cheating, the opportunities for that exam cheating are not the same as the opportunities for a burglary. So different crimes have different opportunities for them. Then also here you're talking about reducing the opportunity. So for example, if we're talking about a burglary, or let's take this example. When you go to your favorite mall, you normally have, you go with your car, you have that chip that you insert for the payment toll. So as you see here, that will be able to protect your car from getting stolen. But it doesn't mean that someone would come into your car and steal whatever is inside. Or for example, you take the, the example of a burglary where you may lock your house, but whatever is outside your house, it will remain vulnerable for people to come steal. So just because you've reduced the opportunity for burglary, doesn't mean that you've reduced the opportunity for things outside your compound getting stolen. Then you have a third principle. Crime opportunities are concentrated in time and space. So this is, this is where the routine activity theory comes in. So it talks about one routine activity is when you come from your home to go to school or to go to work. So that, th that activity means that your house is vulnerable to burglars coming to steal because you're not available. So the points that justify this, this principle is the first one, Many people and things are not suitable targets for criminal attack. So for example, we can talk about a soldier. No person in their right mind will go attack a soldier or a police officer. So these people, they are not prime for criminal attack. Then also, many locations are unfavorable for crime to occur. So you may take an example of a police station or an army barracks. So no one, no one in their right mind will say, let me go attack these barracks because it will put your life at risk. Then also the third one is, a given location may be ideal for crime at one time, 
and I'm available at another time. So for example, a supermarket. It's easier to steal a supermarket at night when there is nobody compared to during the day when there's security and other people present. Then also this fourth point, it talks about guardianship. So a guardian is someone whose presence means that no crime will, the crime will be discouraged. For example, a homeowner. The presence of a homeowner will discourage uh, something like a burglary, a receptionist, there won't be petty theft, and also security guards, your house won't be robbed as a result. Then the last one, nor can the most likely offenders be everywhere. So you cannot expect an offender to be at every possible crime target. So all of these five points mean that these opportunities will be spaced out in time and space. Then the fifth one is crime opportunities depend on everyday movements of activity. So this brings about two theories. The first one is the rational choice theory. The second one is the crime pattern theory. So if we take the examples of pickpocketers. So they take advantage of when people are going home. Or even when you're going home, there are so many people. So it means that it's easier to steal from you and run away. Then burglars take advantage of the fact that nobody is home. So once you go away, go to work, they take advantage and come steal your property. So as much as there are people who may, people like vendors, they sell their things, it also gives opportunities for pickpockets and also bag snatchers. So they'll make sure that look at the flow of people. So as much as people are going from home to work, that is where the burglars will take advantage. And when the people are going back from work to home, that is where the pickpockets will come in as a result. Then also we have another one that is, next principle, one crime produces opportunities for another crime. So for example, if we talk of a burglary, a burglary is one crime, but from burglary you can have sale of stolen goods, uh, assault, murders, so this one crime, it results in other crimes or even, you know, credit card fraud is a crime also. So once you steal cards from somebody's house and go and use them, that is another crime you have committed as a result. Then also, you can also commit other crimes as a result of that primary crime you have committed. So you see about the burglaries you have, you will still sell stolen goods, that is a crime under the law and also stolen credit cards. That is also a fraudulent activity. Then you also have other examples here. Say for example, you steal from somebody and still sell those stolen goods, then buy drugs. You see, that is another crime that you have committed as a result. Then also another crime. For example, you go steal from a bank and they're very successful. You'll go again and commit that crime again. So it's a crime upon another crime. Then also, once you spend time with those co-offenders, you'll be exposed to more crime and go commit other crimes as a result. Then also, spending time in dangerous people, dangerous hours, and also, once you become a drug addict, you know you need money to support these habits. So it means that you go committing thefts and other crimes in order to support these bad habits. And also, once you take these drugs, they'll impair your judgment and harm your decision making. So as a result, if you take drugs, they'll harm your judgment and as a result, commit more crimes as a result. Then also, we have some products offer more tempting crime opportunities. So in the rational choice theory, we spoke about the concept of viva. We have the value, inertia, visibility, and access. So the example here is the DVD players. So of course they are high in value. Inertia means that they are easy to carry. Visibility means that you can see them easily and also accessibility. The offender can easily access this product. Or even an easy example is cash. Cash is of high value, can easily carry it. It is easily visible and also you can access it easily. So of course all this, this is what makes the decision-making of the offender as a result. 
So there are results that also show vehicles, some vehicles are of more risk compared to others. So that is about the value. Because as a thief, you choose to steal something that is of higher value compared to someone because maybe you want to resell it in the future. It also talks about shoplifting and other things. So when you see a cash, cash fits the viva criteria because it is of high value, easily carried, visible, and also easily accessible. Then you also have jewelry, things like gold, diamond rings. The value is high. They are very light. They are visible, and also it's easy to access them on the target. So that's why it says lightweight goods, their robbery has increased because they fit these four criteria. Then also it talks about social and technological changes produce new crime opportunities. So this is a talk about computers. So there are four stages of every new product. So for example, innovation. Innovation is where you come across a new product, for example, computers. So when you are producing these computers at the start, they are very expensive. Nobody knows how they are used and also they are bulky. So if you want to steal such a thing, it will be of no use because you don't know how to use it in the first place and also because it's expensive, you won't sell it to anybody. So it is of no use to you. Then the second part is the growth stage. So now things are ready in the market and it means that you can start to understand they are being used. So now they become easier to use, they become cheaper, and this part of being heavy and awkward, it is no longer a question or a problem because they are much lighter. So this is where the laptops will come in. Then you have the mass market. So mass market is where this product becomes more popular. So there are more units in the market and hence the theft of these products increases at most. Then you have the saturation. So you talk about saturation, there are, there are so many in the market that their value reduces. So that's why you say, everyone who wants the product already has it. So the need of them being stolen, it reduces. So as we talk about even DVD players, because they're everywhere and they're so cheap, they're no longer in demand. So even the chances of being stolen, they become much less because if you are to sell them, you won't get much money as a result. Then also you can talk about crime can be prevented by reducing opportunities. So here we have four types of uh, methods of reducing opportunity. So the main ones are the last two. But for this principle, the main one is the situational crime prevention. Where it talks about we have five solutions and five techniques. So for example, we talk about when you lock your car, it means that you have reduced the opportunity for your car being stolen. Or for example, if you lock your valuables in a safe or your money, nobody can steal it because you have taken the necessary precautions. For example, even you talk about exam cheating. Once you put the necessary rules in place, for example, no cheating, you put maybe CCTV, it means that you have reduced the opportunity of that crime being committed. Then also, the next principle is reducing opportunities does not always displace crime. So when you talk about displacing crime, it means moving the crime. So there are five types of displacement. So the first one is geographic. Geography is when you move it from one location to another. Then you have the temporal. Temporal is from one time to another, for example, during the day to the evening. Then also, a third type of displacement is target. So you take your target of crime from one target to another one. Then also you have tactical. Tactical is where you change the method or the tactic of committing the crime. Then the last one is crime type. So you change the types of crime you are committing. So according to this theory, as much as you're reducing that opportunity for crime, it doesn't mean that this crime will make these five types of movements. So for example, there are some points that we must consider before coming to that conclusion. So we can take the example of a supermarket. If you put CCTV in a supermarket, 
it doesn't mean that a shoplifter will go to another supermarket as a result. So because we assume that the shoplifter has chosen that supermarket for a particular reason. So maybe they have some convenience that that supermarket provides to another wine. Then also another one. So this is the geographic displacement. When they move from one supermarket to another supermarket. Then the second one is where we move from one type of crime to another one one target so yeah, the we are the new target you have is office supplies or even geographic you cannot you cannot move from a supermarket to steal from your own workplace so those theories research has shown that this theory is not always the same then also you can take the example of drug markets so for example some of the things that the original location is chosen because of convenience. So one convenience is how easily to reach it or the convenience to other buyers or even the presence of shops and even public phones. So those locations are chosen for a particular reason. Then the last one is focused opportunity reduction can produce wider declines in crime. So yeah, in simply means that diffusion of benefits. When you talk about diffusion, it means diff uh, benefits will spread to other locations. So for example, we sp sp spoke about the supermarket. Once you put the CCTV outside a supermarket, also the neighboring locations will benefit from the same CCTV protecting their premises. So it means that these benefits have been shared from the supermarket to other neighboring locations also. Then also you have other examples, for example, CCTVs. This was a study done in England. So it means that when you put CCTVs in a car park, other neighboring car parks have also benefited as a result of that surveillance or also cases of vandalism. They were reduced as a result of these CCTVs in the bus park, in the double-decker buses are also in the library. So if you put the electronic tag in, not only were books stolen less, but also video cassettes. Because now the offender thinks that everything else has the same security measure. Then also in retail stores, this was also noticed and also uh, on roads when traffic lights were put. Also other roads, there are lesser cases of speeding. Um, this presentation is already in your e-learning portal, so you can read on it and also do your own further reading. And also, thank you for your time. And that's the end of our class. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.